here is New York. Commuters give the city its tidal restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity. But the settlers give it passion. E.B. White would have described me as a settler. In fact, I became a New Yorker to pursue my passion for design. My name is Daniela Ohad. I'm here at Carpenter's Workshop Gallery to interview the architects, designers, curators, and critics who shape this season. Welcome to Harvest Dialogues. The National Design Awards celebrates innovation and excellence in American design. In the category of architecture, this year award goes to Weissman Freddy, a New York firm founded by Marion Weiss and Michael Manfredi. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Your story reminds me of classic Hollywood when Catherine Hefborn and Spencer Tracy were equally dynamic and powerful. Marion, what is marriage for architects who work together? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, we began actually as partners uh, collaborating on design and postponed the idea of marriage for a very long time because it seemed so perfect without being married uh, that I think we were nervous about what that might do. Um, but when we became a married couple, I think what was very nice is that we could each give each other courage uh, right at that moment where you have doubts. Beautiful, Micah, what about? Well, I think we both realize we have this um, deep, deep, deep passion for architecture. And when I discovered that Marianne shared that passion, and when I discovered that we both in some ways surprised each other because we both have very strong egos, but together, we could do uh, better architecture. Well, I think then it was inevitable that we should fall in love, inevitable that we should be absolutely consumed by our passion for architecture. You not only design schools, but both of you are educators. Marion, you teach at UPenn. Michael, you teach at Cornell. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for architects to teach? It's a great question, and I think Architecture is a very demanding lover, I think, a demanding profession. But what teaching does do is that it gets you outside of your own work so that you can have the benefit of seeing and being challenged by very bright students. So I think we teach because the questions that come out of the teaching sometimes provoke us to do better work. Marion, do you learn from your students? Well, we not only learn from our students, but we learn from our colleagues as well. And both Michael and I have been teaching actually longer than we've been practicing. Mm -hmm. And I think coming right out of graduate school, that was a great way to keep the questions elevated for broader, more complex projects than we could possibly take on just at the beginning. And it continues then to act as a refreshing, uh, I would say, provocation and prod for both of us to keep the ambitions high. We put that pressure on our students. We ask those broader cross-disciplinary questions. And that means that we can't help but ask mm -hmm. those very same tough and challenging questions to ourselves. Yeah, putting pressure on students is my <laughs> hobby. <laughs> you can relate to that, right? <laughs> yes, totally. Your, your buildings are not unified by style, mm -hmm. but by the way, the exquisite way in which you integrate architecture within its landscape. What type of experience this approach can bring? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think the pressing environmental concerns that every part of the world is facing means that you can't solve important problems just with architecture, just with engineering, just with landscape. And so for us, those environmental questions became the idea that architecture and landscape could together make uh, for a much better world, a much more um, ecologically sensitive world. So for me, there was never a question of architecture or landscape, but it's a question of architecture and landscape. 
Is there anything American in your architecture? I think that the most amazing thing that is truly American is the idea of a large terrain in a landscape. And you could say that Jefferson, when uh, Washington DC was laid mm. out, looked at almost an agricultural pattern by which we could map the land and create a territory. And then the thing that made it truly American is that L'Enfant from France came with the idea of the diagonal axes, which was a truly international influence in what that American landscape might be. Talking about public architecture, most of your architecture is public. You do libraries, uh, educational centers, visitor centers. What is the role of public architecture in our culture? I, I think to pick up on that, you mm -hmm. could say that our preoccupation is to allow as much architecture to be public as possible, even when it's very, very private in part because architecture was often for the wealthy, by the wealthy, exclusive and excluding. Even museums were viewed as very special places only for those who knew that they could enter and appreciate the art. So our interest in the public dimension of architecture is to say that it really is a kind of democratic terrain where people really should feel nourished and included in it and not have to feel as if they've read the libretto behind it to tell them why they should be there. In 1918, Vienna was devastated by the loss of four giants, Gustav Klimt, Egon Schiele, Koloman Moser, and Otto Wagner. Wagner was an educator, urban planner, and the foremost architect of Vienna's golden age. Derek Ostergaard, design historian, writer, and curator, is here to remark on the centennial of Wagner's passing Derek, Wagner was the first architect to note that modern architecture should be free from historicism and he said it long before Le Corbusier. He also said that form followed, should follow function long before Miss Wanderer. Yet it seems that his legacy has disappeared. Why? Well, his death came in perhaps the most significant year of the early 20th century, 1918. It marked the end of the First World War. There was the enormous flu epidemic, which he d died in, along with a lot of other artists. Austria itself, which was the Austro-Hungarian Empire, ceased to exist in the following year under the Treaty of Versailles. So he, his national basis of support, his country, was basically gone as of 1919. So as a result, he disappeared along with the country itself. And today? And today? Well, you, you, you don't see architects today inspired by Wagner. No, I really don't. And this really brings to mind that you have to travel to Vienna to understand Wagner. Correct. Because you are in Vienna, you can, he's there everywhere. What is your favorite building? Of Wagner? The uh, Postal Savings Bank, which to me is perhaps the finest bank building I've ever been into. Um, it's designed, as the Germans would call it, as a Gutsamkunstwerk, a total work of art. He did the chairs, he did the carpets, he did the lighting fixtures, he did everything, apart, including the building. So in the end, it is so cohesive, and the brilliance of it is so much of it is intact. So if you go there, you'll basically see what the people who used the bank saw in 1906 when it opened. Something else about this bank is the floor plan is Baroque, but the floor itself is made of glass blocks. Yes. And it's still looking cutting edge. Yes, and that added to a little bit of a sense of terror, to walk on glass. Not that he was the first to do that, it was done in many other places prior to the time, but at a principal major bank in Vienna, for someone to glide across that translucent floor with light coming up from beneath was remarkable. I know, still. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to tell you what is my favorite building. Uh, there is one building that when I visited, my heart dropped. And it is the church in the Steinhoff Hospital, psychiatric hospital in Vienna. Have you visited it? Yes. 
for me, to be very honest, it was a rather frightening experience, the way it's situated up on those terraces and the grandeur of the overall dome and the towers around it. So you get this rather strange sense that this is the jewel in the crown. It sits on the side of this hill. But the beauty, the splendor of the interior, the color, the uh, stained glass windows by Coleman Moser, the magic that he was able to create, it's a little bit off-putting because you think this is a, a church for people who are suffering from nervous and psychiatric disorders. This church still serves the patients in the hospital and few tourists who are really lovers of architecture. No, absolutely. It's, I'm glad it was able to last until there was a resurgence in the 1980s of Otto Wagner's work. The Glasgow School of Art was completed in 1909 by Charles René Mackintosh. Architecture lovers all over the world were devastated early this summer when the school was demolished by fire. Immediately, controversy surfaced. Some believe that the school should be rebuilt according to the original drawings. Others argue that a new talent should be brought in to design the school in a new, contemporary way. Juliet Kenching, curator of modern art at MoMA, has a special connection to the Glasgow School of Art. Juliet, you were there that day. I was indeed. It's, it's a day that was a very big day for me personally. Um, in fact, I'd been asked to come and receive an honorary doctorate at the Glasgow University and Glasgow School of Art. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. So the very afternoon of that devastating fire, I was in fact addressing the graduating cohort of art school students. Um, and it was a wonderfully joyous and celebratory day. There was so much creative energy, it was palpable in, in the graduation hall. Uh, and any, I think any graduation is such a, a, a marking point uh, in, in our lives. And the whole art school is a, a place, a building that's really engraved in in my head and heart because I actually had the privilege of working there um, o over a decade. So I think that uh, gives you a very particular insight into what constitutes really great architecture. But, but coming back to the, the moment of the fire, uh, so, oh, it even makes me well up now. A terrible loss, a terrible loss. I remember when visiting Glasgow 20 years ago that this building, the Glasgow School of Art, has a special place in the hearts of people living there, sort of like a source of pride. Everyone gravitated to the creative energy of the building and its, its surroundings. The question of whether to rebuild according to the original drawings or to create a wholly new building touches on issues of restoration reproductions of buildings and reinterpretation. What is your position? Well, certainly Macintosh is an architect and designer whose work is constantly being imitated, reproduced uh, in a number of ways. And I think one has to look at um, each case of reproduction um, on, on its own merits. But this is a debate that really started after the first fire in 2014 when the entire library wing of the school was burnt down. And there were questions then um, about whether to rebuild and um, reinstate that wonderful library.
but to reinstate this brilliant design, the skills are there, the, um, the documentation is there, and I think there is simply no other design, however brilliant, that could take the place, the, the symbolic place. So, uh, all in all, in this instance, I am I am completely behind the the view that it should be rebuilt. I'm holding here the third volume of the superb series Makers of Modern Architecture, which Martin Filler published last month. This book teaches us the value of great architecture, how to find the soul in buildings, and how to sharpen our perception. And it reads like a thriller. Martin, thanks for being here. My pleasure. By looking at the way buildings have been criticized, remembered, restored, you reveal in your book that tastes keep changing. And I want to ask you whether there is such a thing, as an architecture critic, whether there is such a thing as universal good architecture that has nothing to do with the taste and ideology of its period. I've always been a very strong believer that architecture, whether we want it to or not, or, or intended to or not, will inevitably reveal the values of the society and specifically the people who commission it. And uh, it has happened sometimes in um, wonderfully inspiring ways, such as the, um, um, say in the uh, late Reformation, when the Catholic Church wanted to uh, reassert um, its supremacy over the threat of Protestantism, and it built these splendid Baroque um, showpieces by Bernini in Rome. Sometimes it could be very dark uh, when one of the avowed purposes of Nazi architecture was to actually frighten and intimidate people and, and press them into subjugation through its overpowering and frightening scale. I don't think there is anything as absolute universal good taste or good architecture. I think there are certain principles such as harmony, proportion, balance, repose, uh, that uh, can be expressed in many ways. For example, I find uh, a great many of Frank Gehry's buildings to be wonderfully well balanced and actually have a feeling of repose, even though they, they can be very dynamic. It doesn't mean that these two qualities can't um, uh, exist in conjunction. There was the belief around the mid uh, 20th century, especially with the architecture of Mies van der Rohe, that somehow architecture had reached a point of perfection where it could never change again. We had eliminated everything that was not necessary. We had pure platonic perfection and that the world would be happy repeating that format forever and ever. Well, people get bored. There are um, many aspects to taste, one of which is novelty. And let's face it, architecture has a strong commercial aspect and it's very difficult to um, uh, keep giving clients the same thing century after century. <laughs> you have made your name as an architecture critic who is bold even when your views are not flattering. And when I read this book, it's very clear to me who you like and who you don't like, what building you like, what building you don't like. I want to ask you about just one example about Paul Woodolf. He's a very interesting case study. First of all, I don't think a critic should only write about what he or she likes. If that were the case, our books would be much thinner. Um, Paul Rudolph is, is very instructive to me because when I was growing up in the 1960s, he was at the very top of the profession in terms of uh, critical praise. Everyone thought that in the um, aftermath of Frank Lloyd Wright's death in 1959, that the greatest next American architect was going to be Paul Rudolph. As we know, it actually turned out to be uh, uh, Louis Kahn. Uh, that was less apparent at the moment. Um, then through a, a, a series of um, bad career choices and other mishaps, including the burning of his Yale Art and Architecture building, um, and a turning away from the brutalist architecture that, that he championed, 
um, Rudolph's reputation um, plummeted and um, he couldn't get work in the United States. He, he, he spent the last years of his life uh, working in Southeast Asia. Um, and then by the time of his death, um, he was practically a forgotten figure. So I think there are ups and downs and cycles of acceptance and rejection and taste. And I think Rudolph uh, is a very good example. Uh, I think even an architect who I don't consider to be a good one can be a very interesting one. No industry has shaped New York City as real estate, and no industry has been dominated by such a small number of families. New York real estate has captured the interests of everyone living in New York and the imagination of people elsewhere. New York Rising is a new book co-authored by Kate Asher and Tom Mellins, illustrates the history of real estate in Manhattan. How are you? Very well, thank you. Congratulations. I know I'm the first one to hold this book. You are. This book really started with one passionate collector and with his extraordinary collection, Seymour Durst. So in the 60s, he started acquiring material related to New York City architecture and real estate. And this collection has eventually found its home at Columbia University. Kate, you have used this material in your classes where you teach at Columbia. That's right. The, uh, the collection arrived when I did in 2011. It was gifted to Avery Library at Columbia by the family. And I happened to start teaching there at the same time and decided it would be very nice if there were a history of New York City real estate class that could actually use the Durst Archive for their primary source material to do papers and to study. Tom, have you ever met him? I did. Uh, it goes back several decades, and I was working on a project about Times Square, uh, and someone told me that the uh, developer Seymour Durst had this fantastic material on Times Square, including its uh, seedier elements, and, uh, but a whole range of material. And so I called uh, Mr. Durst, and I explained what I was doing, and he said, well, uh, please uh, use the collection. And he explained that it was housed in his home, which at that time was uh, in the East 60s in a townhouse. And he said, I'll just leave the front door open for you, make yourself at home. So I went over and I'm finding this great material and there are books everywhere, uh, literally. Uh, and, but I don't find Mr. Durst. So I go up to the second floor and I continue to do my research. I go up to the third floor. Eventually I see a ladder going up to the roof. It was a hot September day. And I climbed up and there is Mr. Durst sunning on the roof. Uh, Memorable meeting. Yeah, very. You've devoted a lot to the uh, real estate in New York during the 20s and 30s in the book. Why this, what made this period special and important? Well, in, in some ways it was the sort of heyday of the skyscraper. And when people think about New York, they think about New York being tall and dense and they think about skyscrapers. And really the period before the Great Depression in 1929 was one of the sort of crowning moments in skyscraper history. Tom, New Yorkers love living in pre-war buildings. Indeed, and I think there are lots of reasons for that. For a, a completely different project, I've been rereading Vitruvius, going back to the ancients, and he describes the three qualities of a good building being firmness, commodity, and delight. And the interwar apartment buildings have those qualities. They're solid, they're well-built, they're commodious, they're spacious, and they're lovely to look at. And they're also great to live in. I live in one. Yes, so do I. They're great to live in. And um, I want to ask you about New York City developers. Yeah. Are they different 
than developers elsewhere? I think that the development in community, uh, community in New York is indeed unique. Obviously, there are real estate communities in all the great cities, but in New York, uh, for a variety of reasons, a, a particular uh, group of uh, people got involved, uh, perhaps because they had fewer opportunities in other industries at the beginning of the 20th century, and they became very civically engaged. So while real estate is thought of as a kind of down and dirty business in some cities, in New York, uh, the, the, the community has really reached out and, and made major contributions in terms of philanthropy, in terms of good government, in terms of education. So it's really integrated into the life of the city in multiple ways. So congratulations, and I feel honored to be the first one to hold this book. Yes. Before you. <laughs> Before the proud parents. <laughs> and thanks for tuning in. Until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode is brought to you by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.